हेलो फ्रेंड्स दिस इज योर फ्रेंड विवेक बजाज को फाउंडर इलन मार्केट्स एंड स्टॉकेज आई होप यू गाइस आर डूइंग हैप्पी इन लाइफ सो आर वी इलन मार्केट्स हैव बीन अ ग्रेट ग्रेट सोर्स ऑफ इंस्पिरेशन फॉर ऑल ऑफ अस वी आर क्रिएटिंग सम रियली रियली गुड कंटेंट फॉर द पब्लिक इन लार्ज सो दैट ऑल ऑफ यू अंडरस्टैंड द रियल आर्ट एंड साइंस बिहाइंड स्टॉक मार्केट we conduct online programs we conduct offline programs and one of the program which we recently conducted and concluded was a eight city tour on simple thing how to make money from stock market we visited eight all big cities and we had incredible attendance from people from that particular city on an average we got 300 people who came and listened to us no more about us and what kind of value we are adding to them one of the city my favorite city my own city kolkata i had the privilege of having sri ramesh damani who is my guru my mentor to come down and talk to the audience and we had 430 people who were there people standing all around as well and people were listening to him his mantra of success in stock market he made he made us some incredible points he gave us a fantastic lecture on how to create wealth from stock market and his way of looking at market which is very unique and that's the reason why he has been one of the major wealth creators from stock market in india today i'm going to give that whole lecture to you free of cost in this youtube channel for some of you it may be repetitive as well because he has been quite instrumental in giving us lot of such content but trust me friends you have to hear this out this 15 minutes of video is going to change the way you look at market from a wealth creating perspective so enjoy this video have a great time do comment if you have anything to comment on or do you like this video and if you have not yet subscribed to the channel elan markets you better subscribe it now because we are doing some really good work which is going to make you an independent and sensible investor in market So the video is here do enjoy this video and have a great life ahead thank you it's a great pleasure for me to come and speak to you about money because that's as we were said we all go to the stock market only for one reason to make money in the stock market so when i was much younger uh, i went to someone in the stock market and said mujhe bahut jaldi 50 lakh rupaye banana hai share bazar mein to sir bahut aasan hai to 1 crore rupaya leke aa ja 50 lakh ho jayega so that's uh, <laughs> some elderly lady told me the ramesh remember in life love is more important than money but i told her i love money <laughs> so i want to speak to you about money something which i truly enjoy but there are two things that always diverge in the stock market i think when mr tapadia speaks to you will talk to you about options trading but i'll talk to you about investing investing there are always two themes that run through an investment market the first theme is people will tell you timing is very important in the market lo becho aaj nikal jao aaj press conference se sita varan ka le lo kal bech do they will say timing is very important in the market the other school of thought that tells you that time in the market is more important they have to give businesses time for it to succeed for your investment to succeed so what is correct is it timing the market or is it time in the market i'll try and present both points of views and then uh, we'll get on to what are the basic lessons in investment and what do i look for the next year which are more important to all of you today so <clears throat> this is one of the most uh, national geographic is one of the oldest magazines in the world and this is probably the most most famous photograph in its 135 year history it's a photograph of an afghan girl at a refugee camp and after 135 years the public the readers of national geographic the editors of national geographic call this the mona lisa of the east the mona lisa of all photographs this is the one photograph of 135 years of national geographic photographing everything found to be the most compelling photograph but let me tell you bad investments and sometimes age you can see what has happened to this woman after a span of almost 2 or 3 decades the eyes still glare at you but the face has not softened it's become very hard so time has not been very friendly to this woman sometimes investments are very good 
Sometimes they are bad. There is a lesson in this which I'm telling you, which I'll come to in a minute. But before that, let me show you two other photographs, which I thought would be interesting, just to speak a bit more about photography. I'm old. I'm, I was alive a long, many years ago. And this is a photograph in 1973 of Mrs. Gandhi. During the first OPEC crisis, in order to save oil for our country, she used to go by Tonga to her office, you know, to make a symbolic thing. So it's a very iconic photograph. And of course, who doesn't remember that photograph in 1983? when Kapil Dev and India won the first World Cup at Lord's and it was a proud moment for all India. So these are two iconic photographs in India post-independence history. Of course, there are a few more, but not that many more. But you remember these iconic moments very, very clearly. So the fact of the matter is that, and of course, uh, before I come to that, everyone's taking photographs today. This is at some conference or exhibition. Just look, everyone is using their self, cell phones to take a photograph, right? So by any accounts, the photography market in the world over the last 30 years has exploded. It has become manifold. It's gone from 80 billion photographs to 1.3 trillion photographs. Per capita, 22,000 photographs we take. It's a CAGR of 54%. So it's pretty obvious. I don't need to tell you that. You all understand that the photography market globally has exploded. I think almost everyone here has a smartphone. Almost everyone takes a few selfies a day. Right? So we know the market is exploded. Now, can anyone in the audience tell me that, say, in 19, 2000, which were the most important photography company in the world? Any guess? Kodak, thank you very much. You got one right. There was another company that I'm called Polaroid. Between these two companies, they controlled the market for photography. Is Kodak alive today? It's dead. Is Polaroid alive today? How is that possible in a market that has grown so much, we take 1.3 trillion photographs, that the two leading companies in the world that took cameras and photography to the public have vanished. And that is a lesson for investing sometimes, that even the most impregnable business, time, technology, trends, can change the outlook for the business. What happened to Kodak and Polaroid? Kodak and Polaroid both saw the digital movement coming. So it wasn't that digital photography upended them. But Kodak used to do so many things. They used to make the film by which the picture was taken. They used to process the film. All those businesses were eaten away by digital photography. You didn't need film anymore. You didn't need to process photography anymore. So the margins got attacked and the business of digital photography became a commodity and all the competitors like Casio, Seiko came into the business. So this one proud company was completely annihilated by the marketplace. What was Polaroid? Polaroid is again run by a genius called Edwin Land. But he couldn't understand for the life of him that people wouldn't want a physical copy of a photograph. At the heart, Edwin Land was a chemical engineer. He could not believe that people would see photographs on a phone like we see today. Right? As a result, both of these companies lost their uh, place in the marketplace. So the first lesson from that is, of course, that technology can change any business. No matter how good it seems, how good the moat is, the business can evaporate before our eyes if you're not careful to the changes that take place in the marketplace. Here was a company that had 80, 85 percent market share, have gone into bankruptcy now. And it's not that we're not taking photographs, we're taking more photographs. And yet, the most dominant companies can lose their edge over a period of time. So here's the second thing I'd like to bring to your attention. I'm from Bombay. I don't know about Calcutta. But Bombay, you're judged by three things. You're judged by which school your children go to. It's very hard to get admission to a good Bombay school. You're judged by which club you're a member of. Do you get membership of the Cricket Club of India or Willingdon? Then you're someone in Bombay. And three, where is your parking spot? Societies fight over parking spots. Right? So in the area where I live in, in Mumbai, in South Mumbai, a parking spot like this, you know, open, goes from between, in most societies, between 25 lakhs and 50 lakhs. Okay, that is the cost of a parking spot. So here's a question to investors. What is this parking spot going to be worth in 25 years? Zero. Yeah, you've heard my presentation, I'm sure. <laughs> Good enough, OK? But can anyone understand why it will be zero? Bigger pardon? 
yeah, good point. I'll explain this to the audience who's not seen their presentation. I think it'll be zero, and when I tell my wife that, she tells me to get out of the house because she doesn't want to believe me, you know. But I could have said the same thing with the Kodak stock, 80% market share, where it's going to go? It went down to zero, right? So technological changes happen in the marketplace, and it is our duty as investors to understand them. So when people say long-term investing means being in the market, staying put to a stock, that's not necessarily true because your company can go to bankruptcy before you realize that. So anyway, so what is this parking spot worth in 25 years? Let me take you through a little bit of history. So <coughs> this is an example of a New York street in 1900. If you look very carefully where the circle is, most of the cars there are actually horse-driven carriages. In 1900, in New York, people went from point A to point B in a horse-driven carriage. All right? The red circle represents the one automobile at that time. Right? So 1900, everyone in New York goes in a horse-driven carriage. That is the taxi, that is the transportation of its time. Except the first guy got the electric carriage. What happens 13 years later? The same street, the same morning on Easter Eve, everyone is driving an electric car. You cannot even see one horse-driven carriage. So in 13 years, the world completely changed. If you were a supplier of horses, supplier of saddles, supplier of people who cleaned horses, you were out of business. No one used those things anymore. The entire industry moved to fuel combustion, petroleum-driven cars. All right? In 13 years, just think of it. We say that change is happening now, but at the turn of last century, the same thing happened. The old businesses gave in, the new businesses came out. So, what is the new or epoch change that is happening as I speak to you? All right? And a lot of intelligent people say that what is happening now is what is called the end of the oil age. And here is a statement by Sheikh Yamani which I found very uh, prophetic. And I'll read it out to you. He says, the stone age didn't end because they ran out of stones. Now think about it. The Stone Age didn't end because they ran out of stones. Technology moved on to the Iron Age and the Bronze Age and the Electronics Age. So the Oil Age won't end because you run out of oil. It will run out because technology will overtake oil itself. For example, we are talking about the end of oil. This is what is important. What will happen here is the International Combustion Engine gives way to the Integrated Circuit and the iStore residing app. So instead of having cars that are run on fuel, they run by electric batteries, all right? And we will go from a position of fuel cars to electronic cars and from electric cars to autonomous cars. What do I mean by autonomous cars? Anyone has an idea? Someone say, someone stand up and say. Anyone? It's a driverless car. It's a driverless car, right? So just like you put coordinates in the GPS. So say I'm staying at the Kalamandir, I want to go to my hotel which is the Taj. I just put on my smartphone, car comes pick me up without a driver, drops me there, moves to another place, right? Goes to other place. So now we use a car maybe 5% to 10% of the time, correct? Because most of the time it's parked below a house or parked in an office. So suddenly, we won't need a car anymore because everyone will have access to an autonomous vehicle coming and dropping us, right? If you don't have a car, are we going to need a parking spot? If you don't need a parking spot, what's the value of that parking spot, right? So the thing that we fight for so much is probably going to become redundant in the next 25 years. So what is enabling this is a huge amount of technology that is taking place. So all these electric cars run obviously on power, they don't run on fuel. So obviously the cost of fuel will also decline dramatically. <coughs> but look at the future of all these industries. If you don't have an auto, would you need auto insurance? No. Won't you need uh, auto ancillary companies? Like would you need, you know, spark plugs for example? No. Would you need steering wheels? No. The cars will pretty much drive themselves. Everyone has a driver uh, who has a car because it's so difficult to park right now so difficult to move in traffic. You won't need that because the cars will regulate themselves. In fact, the de demand for roads will come down because you generally will have cars going one after the other 
So instead of a four lane highway, you could do with a two lane highway, right? So the cost of infrastructure is still come down. In my city in Bombay, for example, come to South Bombay, they're building a huge metro system which connects North and South Bombay. Bombay is basically North and South. And it will be ready say in five years, but we may not need it because you are now assuming the roads are choked so we get into subway, but with AV, EVs and AVs, the roads will not be choked anymore, right? So you won't need a subway system. So here's the difference between driving a current auto and driving an electric and driverless vehicle. The life of a current auto is 150,000 miles, electric vehicle 500,000 because there's no friction, there's no wear and tear, it just runs almost without a noise itself. What's the cost of a driver? You know, 400, driverless car, zero, you don't need a driver anymore. And anything like suppose you replace spark plugs in US dollars is 400 dollars, nothing, zero cost because you don't have that. So before you jump out and buy an electric vehicle, there's one more point I'd like to say to you is that it is now costly, even at this point as I speak to you, it is costly to buy a electric car, okay? Because uh, <coughs> electric car which is Tesla costs 135,000, a BMW costs 96,000, okay? So it is still capitally more expensive to buy this car, but once you buy it, look at the cost. It costs you only 4 cents a mile to run this car, whereas 16 cents per mile to run a fuel combustion car, right? So there is, in the next five years, we'll get to electric cars. In the next 10 years, we'll get to autonomous cars. So there's a big change. The demand for oil, oil refining stocks will completely collapse over the next five to 10 years thanks to this. So <coughs> I talked to you about time changing the business, right? You have in front of you the photography market, the automobile market, completely changing in 10, 20 years, that's one generation, it has completely changed, right? Are there some businesses that are timeless, that can go through time and time again and still survive and do better? Let's see what history has to tell us about it. Out of the 30,000 companies that are traded in America at a particular point of time, only 4% or 1,000 companies have accounted for the great gain that have taken place over this time. Those of you who haven't watched my presentation before, if I may ask you, which do you think has been the best performing stock in the world over the last 90 years? Philip Morris. Yes, thank you very much. You've all seen that. The Philip Morris. I know, unfortunately, now it's on video, so everyone knows the answer. But that's good. What does Philip Morris do? It's a cigarette manufacturer, right? How much is it up over the last 90 years? Two million times. I have a lot of followers here, so that's good. The stock was up 2 million times, right? Here's the thing that surprised me. What is the best performing stock in America? Philip Morris and Altria. What is the best performing stock in Great Britain? Diageo and uh, uh, BAT. What is the best performing stock in Japan? Japan Tobacco. What has been the best performing stock in India? <laughs> Another tobacco company. Japanese Tobacco, Tobacco Company. BAT, Tobacco Company. Human habits die hard. People are going to smoke, right? The history has shown that no matter what, how much taxes you do, no matter what you do, people still smoke. And what has happened is that people smoking has come down dramatically and the prices have gone up. Governments have put more taxes. But what these guys do is they pay out a dividend at the end of year. They don't need money. You can't get in, you can't advertise, you can't build new capacity because actually demand is going down. So there are a lot of free cash flow. So they give you a lot of dividends and you reinvest the dividends, the stock keeps compounding over time and that makes you a significant amount of money. What Vivek said about compounding is probably the greatest truth that I've learned in the stock market and I will share that with you in my own way later on. But that's really the key because these companies give, throw out free cash flow and you can use that money and invest it back and hence the returns get magnified over a period of time. So Philip Morris has been the uh, best stock. Berkshire Hathaway, everyone knows, uh, I mean, when I was a student in America, the stock price was over under $100. Today, it's over $350,000, right? So it's a hugely <coughs> great company. But there are some businesses that always tend to outperform over a period of time. 
Some of them are liquor, the others are tobacco. Those two are busy because human habits don't change. So people, once they get used to having a beer in the evening or a scotch in the evening, will continue having the same brand for their lives. And that doesn't change over a period of time. There's no technological threat basically to that business. These are the list of 20 stocks that have done the best over the last 90 years. So <clears throat> this is just, I mean, all of you got some names right. Of course, Coke is one of them. Amazon has been there. Uh, even though Amazon has been listed only for 30 years. But these are some of the stocks globally that have had the best appreciation over the last 90 years. So people often ask me, and particularly at this time, it's a good question. They say that <clears throat> you were lucky, Ramesh. You came to India when India was in 89. Index was 800. Today is 40,000. You're lucky. You made so much money out there. Do we have the same opportunities that you people had? You were the lucky generation in a manner of speaking. But here's what I want to present to you. Since I came in 89, this is what has happened in India, all right? Mrs. Gandhi assassinated, Mandal riots, Rajiv Gandhi assassinated, India pledges gold to IMF, economic liberalization happened, the bomb blast happened at the BSC, nuclear tests happened, Cargill happened, Y2K happened, technology meltdown, and here's the other counterparts that happened, including in the last few years, Demon, GST, and BFC trouble, okay? If you were an astrologer and you told me in 1988, when I was coming to India, that Ramesh, you're going to India, but remember, all these things are going to happen, okay? All these things, you know, India will pledge its gold to the IMF, a global meltdown will happen. I may not have come to India, I would have been scared, right? But India grows at night, ladies and gentlemen. Here's a fact. The index has gone from when I told you, came back in 800, to more 40,000 today. It was 1979 hundred, so from that base, 40 years, it's almost gone up 400x, which is a compound annual growth rate of 16% without dividends. That's the most important thing to remember, without dividends. If we include dividends, it'll be great. And as I always said, what we were lucky in was this. Let me first ask you a question. Suppose you're playing, you're watching a basketball game, right, between two teams. And one team had only seven footers, and one team had five footers. But you knew nothing else. Which team would you bet on? Seven footers, right? Because they're going to probably make more baskets than the five footers, right? We had a, the advantage of the seven footers. What was the advantage we had? Mr. Chidamram, unfortunately, with deep regrets, he's in jail right now. But he did Dream Budget 98, which did two things which have dramatically changed the course of economic history of the stock market. He made long term capital gains tax free and he abolished the dividend on taxes. So wealth could compound for long periods without any tax consequence on them. We paid STT, let's not get that right. We did pay, any time we got in and out of stocks, we paid STT out there. So we contributed a lot to STT. But if you didn't trade, people like me who don't trade, who buy and invest quality businesses that we hope will go over a period of time, could build our wealth without uh, interference from the tax authorities. And that helped the stock exchange to great heights. So people ask me that, well, we don't have the advantage right now of being a seven-footed team. This is what I'd like to say, that tax applies only if you sell your investments. It doesn't apply, don't. So you find businesses that you can keep for five, 10 years, there are no tax consequences for you. So my suggestion, as I'll tell you later, is to find those great businesses. As I told you, there are some businesses that stand the test of time. Companies like ITC, McDowell, Levers, have shown over years to give you compounding returns. So it is our job to find those kind of businesses. So I'll give you an example of some great bull markets that have taken place in history. Uh, <clears throat> in 1989, Owen Sensex went from 600 to 4,500. I always like to give the example of the Nikkei, uh, which went up from 1,300 to 40,000. Let me explain to you what that means. Japan was beaten in World War II, all right? It was a country that was destroyed. Nuclear bombs had gone to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the reconstruction boom started. In 1964, Japan became the first Asian country to host the Olympics, right? The Tokyo Olympics. The Nikkei was that time 1300, all right? It started a bull market. When it started the bull market, Japan was a third world country. 
its products were synonymous with cheapness, right? Yet in the next 25 years, they became from a third world country to a G5 country. Their products synonymous with excellence, Toyota, Seiko, Casio, Datsun, Fuji, all these great companies in Japan were built. And the bull market changed the index from 1300 to 40,000, all right? That's what a bull market can do. Bull markets are very special things. Once a bull market starts, it's not easy to knock it down. And sometimes they can change the trajectory of a country. You look back at our own history. You look at the 8992 bull market. It took it from 600 to 4,500, correct? 6x. What did that bull market tell you in 89? The bull market started saying in 85, 88, 89, those early years, that India was going to liberalize. The Berlin Wall was going to fall and changes were going to happen and India would no longer be a socialist controlled economy but in fact be an open outward looking economy. And they got it right. 2000 bull market, the tech bull market so called. What did that tell you? That told you that India is going to become a tech superpower. Right? What happened? Companies like Infosys, Wipro, HCL became household names not only in India but the world. Right? The market foresaw that in 98-99. What are the current bull markets telling you? Is India is going to become a middle class nation, right? We went from a country with some rich people and a lot of poor people to now a bulging middle class, right? The move of these consumption stocks, move in housing stocks, all suggest to us that we are having a very fat middle. We are going to grow like a prosperous Western European country with a strong middle class. We will have that. And people who bet on consumption, the middle class will probably do well. And a part of the 2004 bull market, a part of the current bull market was echoing the similar story. So bull markets are extraordinarily important because they change the trajectory of a nation, they change the career of investing. And the one thing I have learned over long periods of time is that you don't get rich making 10 bucks profit in a bull market. A lot of people got a lot of Infosys, for example, in 94. A lot of people must have bought Infosys. But they made 20 bucks, 50 bucks and got out of it. But the stock went up 50x. Right? So the bull market is very important to buy it right and then hold on till the bull market matures or till the thesis that drove that bull market matures. And most investors make that mistake that they don't manage to hold on to the stock as it goes through its run. I mean, Infosys went from 30 crore IPO to at that time almost 2 lakh crore market cap. So a huge phenomenal run. But very few people were able to hold on for the entire gain. Even in this current run, I mean, something like, say, Titan, it went from being a penny stock almost with a few hundred crores market cap to almost two, two and a half lakh crore market cap. So sometimes there are businesses that if you hold on would deliver absolutely handsome returns to you. Occasionally, of course, you'll be stuck in a photography market or in a car market, which is going nowhere. So it's very important for investors to know and understand the difference between these two. So I just put this thing, you know, what are some emergent technologies that can happen? Uh, most of them are known to you, so I'm not going to repeat myself. But clearly, artificial intelligence, robotics, voice is something I'm trying to think about because increasingly, we don't text to each other. We use Alexa to, what is the weather Alexa? What is the stock market doing? So voice is going to be important. So companies that deal with voice will probably do well for themselves. Before I end, I want to spend some time on lessons for the younger investors because I think that's the purpose of what Vivek does also to empower you to make sure that you have information at your edge so that you can make better decisions. And here are some things that I always try to teach the younger set, okay? The first is the importance of investing in appreciating assets, not depreciating assets. Let me give you an example. You're 25 years old. Anyone's 25 years old here? Yeah, okay. Can you get up, sir? Yeah. What's your name? Okay, a lot of people in your age, you may not do it, I hope you don't, but a lot of people your age, get, are you working somewhere? Huh? Any 25 year old working? Yeah, why don't you get up, gentlemen? Yeah, thank you. What's your name? Shine. Where are you working? PwC, great. And so, how long have you been working now? Three years. And so, do you remember when you got your first paycheck, what do you do? No! You're too good to be true. I'd give my daughter to you. That's pretty good. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> well, he is the exception that proves the rule. I mean, that's pretty good. If you invest in mutual fund, 
give him a gold star, guys. We make free upgrade to him, okay? <laughs> Very good. Most people would go and buy a car, right? Take a vacation, do something like that. Thank you so much. Thank you and congratulations again. The thing is that most people, when they're young, don't realize it, but they invest in depreciating assets. A car is the ultimate example of a depreciating asset. You walk out with it in a driveway, drive it out with it in a driveway, you buy it for 10 lakhs, you can't sell it back for 8 lakhs. One month later, you can't sell it back for 8 lakhs. It's a depreciating asset. So I taught my son this lesson in a very interesting way. He was, uh, you know, going to college in America and he wanted a fancy smartphone at that time, which was like 40,000 rupees or 50,000 rupees. I said, you can have the smartphone or I can buy you some shares worth 40,000, right? There's a chance that the shares will appreciate. There's a 100% chance that your phone will depreciate over time, right? What do you think you chose? The smartphone, right? So, <laughs> they don't listen to their father. But that apart, he learned the lesson though in life. Later on through some other friend of mine, yeah to some for example. So the point is that when you're young, please invest in appreciating assets like that young man there did, or encourage your kids to invest in appreciating assets. Because as Vivek said another point out later, if there's one difference, if you want to know the secret of making money, I'm telling it to you right now, it's compounding, okay? Throw everything else. If you can compound your money, you're gonna end up rich by the time you're 60 which or the time you're 50. That's what you're in the stock market for, okay, to make long-term wealth. If you want short-term money, short-term excitement, go to the horse races, I don't care. Buy lottery tickets. But you want to create long-term wealth, compounding is the way to do it. If there's one single secret that I want all of you to take back, learn compounding. That's the key to wealth. I'll explain that to you in a more in a minute. Then as Buffett has taught us, invest like you're investing in a business, not a stock price. What happens is we take stock price up and down as a substitute for being right or wrong. Bhav bad gaya to achha share hai, bhav gad gaya to kharaab share liya maine, okay? Not basing on the underlying. You know, sometimes if you understand the market cap of a company, it tells you many lessons that this stock is too cheap or this stock is too costly. I bought companies which are at 1000 crores with 1200 crores cash sitting on their books, all right? So that's the opportunity that sometimes markets give you, especially in periods like this, when the market is so bearish and so brutal. So look at it like you're buying a piece of a business. Yeah, I own this business, I'm not buying a stock price. Because then you won't be influenced that it's You'll be influenced by the underlying business that you bought. Build a circle of competency. What do I mean by that? There are 5,000 stocks that trade every day in the stock market, right? How do you know what sugar is doing, what steel is doing, what cement is doing, what tech is doing? You don't. But you can know what a particular industry is doing because you're in that area. Are there any doctors out here in this audience? Any doctors? No? Any engineers? Yeah, great. So all you guys know more about cement and construction than I will ever know because you're in the business. Any bankers in this business? I'm sure there's some, yeah. So you'll know a lot more about banking, sir how the public sector banks are not giving good loans out there, how Axis Bank is probably you know, not running good business, how HDFC Bank is doing a good business. That is your circle of competency, right? Because you're in that business. If you're a doctor, for example, you will know about the pharma business, right? You could have figured out that India is going to become the pharma diabetes capital of the world, right? What does it mean? That who makes the diabetes medicine? Who makes the, you know, exercise gym parlors that people will go to? Who makes the food that the diabetic people use? So you can invest in those stocks as opposed to investing in cement stocks or steel stocks, which you know nothing about. So build a circle of competency. And to repeat compounding, and this is like, I like to do this exercise because it always is the most interesting part to me. So I'll do it. Some other, someone around 20 can raise their hand. Yeah, let's, why don't you, right, okay. What's your name, young man? Huh? Rudra, very good. You also invest in a mutual fund on your first paycheck? <laughs> no, okay, good. I did even know pocket money. Huh? I did, I did even pocket money. You did? Yeah. You're even better than him. <laughs> if I had two daughters, I'd give it to you. <laughs> but let me tell you, as I think uh, Vivek gave a great example, and I think it's an example that I wish you'd take the slide and send it to everyone in for it, that compounding slide. Because that also captures what I'm going to say. But here's what you do. Let's say you're 25 years old and you managed to save 10 lakhs. Worked extra overtime, got a gift, did what do we do? But 
let's say you have a 30 year professional career. He's 25, he'll be 55 in 30 years, right? In that 30 years, suppose you can double your money every three years. How many doubles will you have in 30 years? No. 30 years, you double your money every three years. 10 times you double your money, right? What does that mean? Let's go through that. Let's say you start with 10 lakhs, right? So after three years, how much money will you have? 20 lakhs. After six years, how much will you have? After nine years, how much will you have? Out of 12 years, how much will you have? After 15 years, how much will you have? Three. So let's just say three for argument's sake. Let's say after 15 years, it's three crores. Now see what happens. After 18 years, how much will you have? Six. After 21? 12. After 24? 24. After 27? 50. Let's assume 50. And after 30? How much do you start with? No. You only start with 10 lakhs and you got 100 crores. How is that possible? You start with something like 10 lakhs, okay, which for a 25 year old is not a big sum of money in India today. You can all manage to get that somehow. Work hard, work in two jobs, marry rich. I don't know what you do, but you make 10 lakh rupees, right? But you can make 10 lakhs into 100 crores. What do you have to do for doing that? You have to double your money every three years, right? What does doubling your money every mean? That you have to move your money at about 22-23% compounded over long periods of time. That doubles your money every three years, right? If you remember the slide I went back to, I'll just take it back. Look at this number. The Sensex itself has compounded at 16.5%, all right? That is without dividends. If you add dividends back in there, that gives you another 3-4 percentage points because of time lag, right? So you're already at 19-20%. You have to find a bit better stock than the index and you'll be doing 22%, right? So it's not that particularly hard to do. Is it easy? No. Is it simple? Yes, because you know the math. You find businesses that can double every three years. If that is it, I want to buy it. I don't care what anyone says, right? If it's not, I'm not interested in it. It's that simple. So every time after the seminar or when I do a television interview, people come and tell me, oh, Mr. The money I liked it, here's my money. Can you make it 100 times, you know? <laughs> you know, I wish it was that. <laughs> easy, it's not. But the math is before us. You know, it's obviously requires a lot of effort. I don't mean to say that it's, a, it's an easy process that anyone can go tomorrow buy any stock and double every three years. It doesn't happen like that. But let's say it doesn't happen. You don't get a hundred crores. You get a thirty crores. Is that bad? How many people would be happy with thirty crores right now? Yeah, I think most of us would be happy. Who wouldn't be happy with thirty crores right now? I want to see them. You know, those are the people I want advice from. <laughs> Okay, good. You're more than 30 right now. Tell me what advice you have. <laughs> but do you have 30 crores right now? So I would be happy with 30 crores if I didn't have 30 crores. Okay, I'm saying we all want to be the best. We all want to be Warren Buffett. Please sit. We all want to be John Rockefeller. You all want to be, you know, Mukesh Ambani, right? There's no doubt about that. But I'm saying in a lifetime, if you end up make, say, instead of 100 crores, like I'm telling you, you end up making 35 crores. Okay. At today's exchange rate, it's still worth $5 million. You know how many people in the world are worth $5 million? In the world, forget India, in the world are worth $5 million, okay? I don't think there are more than 10 lakh people in the world that are worth $5 million. And you'll be one of them. And there are 7 billion people in this world, right? So it's a very rarefied club we get into. I mean, you know, I, I don't have the statistics for me. How many people in India declare income of more than 10 lakhs a year or 50 lakhs a year? You'll be amazed at how few people do that, okay? Maybe 50,000 people do it per year, right? So if you can generate that kind of wealth, it is enormous effect on you. It seems very easy when you're young to say, I want to be worth a Rockefeller's worth, or I want to be worth $100 million, I want to be worth a billion dollars. And of course you should, you should try it. Why shouldn't you try it? For most people, what they want is financial freedom. And if you manage to achieve $5 million or $10 million or $20 million, you will achieve financial freedom. And what does it mean, financial freedom? It really doesn't mean that you change your life. It doesn't. It means you probably still go to the same club, drink the same scotch, wear the same clothes, have the same friends. But it gives you some more freedom. You want, your kids want to go to a good school, you send them. Your parents want to take a vacation, you send them. You want a house for your wife, you build that. Okay? That's what financial freedom means to me. And that's what I think it means to most people. It's not that we want it to show off or we want to, you know, you know, do something really stupid or crazy or have new friends. It just means that we want a better life for our children. And that's what financial freedom means. And that's what the stock market can give you. And that's what a disciplined investment program can give you, right?
Look at those great businesses, you know, the tobacco businesses, some banking businesses, liquor businesses, businesses that are compounded over long periods of time. So spend your time thinking about that, thinking about businesses that can grow at 21, 22 percent and they can double in three years. That's the kind of investment you want to look at. <clears throat> you also need to stay the course. So I don't know about this, but uh, oh, sorry. I asked my friend who's probably one of the wisest investors I know and I said, it's pretty much what you might ask me. I asked him what is the best investment period in his career. He's seen everything. He's seen, you know, from 1980s onwards, you know, boom, bus, Babri Masjid, India doing the gold, global financial crisis. I asked him what is the best investment decade in your career been? From starting from 1970s to 2020, what has been the best investment decade you've seen in your career? And he told me very simply, the best investment decade is going to be the next decade, right? That the opportunities of the next 20, 25 years will be far superior than the opportunity for the next last 25. Now, you are going to be particularly not happy with me saying that because the last two years have been miserable, right? We've all lost money, stocks are down 50 percent, right? But sometimes investment is about staying the course, okay? You have to believe in great businesses and you have to stay the course and realize that businesses go up and down. And that's just part of what we do. Like I told you, from 1989 to 2019, we had so many bad things happen to India, right? And yet the index found a way to climb out of the morass and get to 40,000, right? So the last point is stay the course. You have to believe in equity at the end of the day, right? If you don't believe in equity, if you're scared of volatility, the market's down 30 percent, that scares you, you're probably not a good stock market investor, right? It is something that you fundamentally have to believe in the bullishness of India and you fundamentally believe in the power of equity delivering you. And that takes time and effort. And if you're the person who gets scared every time the market takes a knock, I would suggest to you that you either get re-educated or don't look at equities. So here are some investment thoughts for 2019-20. <coughs> I'll point to the third one, BSE finance should be examined. But all the market that has been going down in recent months, everyone's been very depressed, including me, to be honest with you. The BSE 500, 150 stocks in the BSE 500, so almost one third of the stocks, are showing gains of more than 10 percent compared to the index being flat. Right? So there is some churn in the market. There are good stocks that are rising. And what is typical of this third phase of the market, that I call a third phase, is that the headline index goes down or remains stagnant. So you think the market is not doing anything, but internally the market breadth starts to change. The more advances, more decline. I think Chandan may have some better thoughts on that because he's nodding along with me. So you will find, particularly in the last five days, the breadth of the market has been good while the index has not necessarily kept pace, right? Which is a good sign, which means the market is broadening out. A lot of stocks are showing gain. So those are good times to start looking and investing in the market. Modi 2.0 will be economic different. I think for sure, that's, that's for sure. I think what we are seeing is uh, a new India, someone with so much political power that a lot of changes are going to come through in India at this time. Uh, would I say that India has moved decisively to the left in economic matters? Probably, all right? So we'll have to keep that in mind. Uh, there's nobody in India still willing to embrace a right-wing economic ideology who believes in free markets, believes in private enterprise, believes in capitalism from the bottom of his heart. There's no political mandate for that in India. The mandate is more for distribution of wealth, socialism, winning the elections, bottom-up thinking. So that is changing and that must be a part of our investment calculus at all times. And of course, the reversal of the last 30 years. What has happened in the last 30 years, I will tell you. We've had globalization, we've had privatization, we've had free markets. We've had, you know, people, intellectual property moving up. Trump in America, Xi Jinping in China, and maybe Modi in India are now all building protectionist barriers against each other, right? Does that mean investments will be bad? No, it'll be just tougher. You'll have to find new glasses to look for investment. Maybe buy more domestic companies rather than export-oriented companies. Maybe buy companies, you know, involved in, you know, new technologies that could change the world which people would have to use. So you'd have to look it through through different eyes. Making money is never easy, like I told you. It's very hard, but uh, we know. And of course, the last thing that, 
like I told you with the photography industry, this digital disintermediation, whether it's in autos or photography or you know even vegetarian versus non-vegetarian, thanks to these new foods that are coming up, will continue. And of course, disruptive technologies means that the prices are staying down. So that is the reason we are having uh, last uh, negative interest rates in the market because there's so much deflation going in the world. I'll just spend one more minute with the Hong Kong peg looks vulnerable because that's something that might impact us dramatically in emerging markets. For the last 30 years, Hong Kong has been, the Hong Kong currency has been linked to the US dollar. For 30 years, it's remained the same. Now what has happened is the rates are diverging in interest rates. So the peg is vulnerable. So if the Hong Kong currency falls, which I think is likely now, the Hong Kong currency will fall. If that falls, all emerging market currencies will fall. And that would set off some tremor wave in the emerging markets. So it's just something that I would you know, keep in mind that if Hong Kong devalues or breaks the peg, it will send one time shiver through. Uh, so particularly if you're looking for you know, companies that are vulnerable to interest rates or vulnerable to global currencies, that is something I'd you know, think about. And here are, in my view, some potential winners and losers over the next 10, 20 years. I mean, some of them are very obvious. Uh, liquor and tobacco, I've already mentioned to you. Algorithm, some PSU stocks, because they are very cheap right now, so they look good. Some which won't do well, which I've already mentioned to you. Auto, auto ancillary, auto insurance, all these companies will probably face uh, rougher headwinds. So it so happens that uh, <coughs> Chandra will know this uh, well because uh, it so happens that a stockbroker dies Chandan one day and goes to heaven, right? So as he's about to enter heaven, the pujari tells him that, mm, let me check your credentials if you're allowed to go into heaven. And he looks at it, OK, I'll let you go to heaven uh, right now. And after that, a priest comes in to the gates of heaven. And the pujari tells the priest, look, you've been good, but you know, I'm going to give you only temporary admission to heaven, not a permanent admission to heaven. So the pujari gets very upset. He said, I have given you a pravachan, I have given you a gun, and you give me a you He doesn't like it. So the pujari comes down and says, look, be quiet. This is the swarg. In swarg, स्वर्ग में नतीजों का बहुत हम लोग इम्पोर्टेंस देते हैं क्यों लोड ऑफ इम्पोर्टेंस टू डिसीजंस मेड जब आप प्रवचन देते थे पूरा गांव सोता रहता था लेकिन जब शेरदलाल बाजार में आके रुक देता था पूरा गांव प्रार्थना करता था सो वी हैव टू अलाउ हिम टू गो नॉट दैट सो आई होप आफ्टर चंदन आई फिनिश दैट यू वोंट बी प्रेइंग बट you will be paying attention because markets are extraordinarily uh, effective instruments for most of us to create wealth of a lifetime, all right? So you can't think about it that I want to make money for 500 rupees or 1,000 rupees because that's what markets will give you what you want. So if that's what you want to do, that's what you get. You want excitement, market gives you excitement every day, right? But the broader goal of markets is to create wealth for yourself, all right? And the way to create wealth, I'm saying the 10 lakhs or 100 crores is something that'll happen maybe to five of you in this room, right? It won't happen to the rest of you. But even if you take 10 lakhs and make it 10 crores, okay? You're still doing fabulously well. What do you have to do in order to do the 10 crores? You've got to first start investing. You've got to start early because the earlier you start, the more time you'll have to do it. It takes 30 years for 10 lakhs to become 100 crores, okay? So you don't wait till you're 45 to start it. Start at 25, if you're earlier, start at 24. Started these two young people said, you know, with pocket money they started investing. Why not? That's great. Give them a round of applause for starting so early. So start early and invest wisely. Try to find great businesses. There are only very few Infosys in HDFC banks and Wipros, okay? So you need to find them. The first idea is not the best investment idea you'll come across, and anyone's tip won't be the best investment idea. It's something you deep, deep inside you to find your own ideas. It's not easy to come up with great investment ideas. So just because someone comes on television, Chandan and I come, we, we say something doesn't make it a good investment. Do your homework. But the consequence of doing that, especially if you see India on a trajectory like we are, are enormously beneficial for all of you. You create enormous amounts of wealth, 
give you financial freedom, which is why the reason we're all here. So thank you all very much. Thank you so much, sir, for this fantastic. Although, uh, I just said, a lot of people must have seen your videos uh, in YouTube and a couple of your examples may be something repetitive. But uh, I think all of us will agree that the more we hear from you, the same thing again and again, probably our sense inside our mind probably in some way get triggered that guy is making sense, is making sense, is making sense. All of us are Yeah, all of us are Yes. So, why do we pray every day in the morning to God? Ultimately, it's the same prayer, no? But we keep on saying the same prayer again and again because we want to re-emphasize that thought process inside our minds. So, thank you so much for coming. And I just like to take an opportunity to wish you a great I'm really impressed with this young man. He's doing a wonderful thing out there. So, I really wish him success. I think he did a real act. I think mean, uh, investing is also about information, having information edge, and I think you're providing that, which is. Almost God's work. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Ciao.